All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join Landmarks Con Landmark Conservancy's 2023 annual meeting. I'm Kristen Thompson, and I'm the Advancement Director. And uh, um, each year, we look back on work accomplished during our fiscal year and reflect on different themes that may have emerged um, across our various projects and activities. And this year in particular, we noted um, a number of inspired, um, an exceptional number of inspired individuals, decisions, and actions that wove through our work. Um, and this syner synergy is immensely gratifying and propels us forward. Thus, we arrived at Catalysts and Changemakers as our theme. And as we move through the meeting, I invite you to notice these influences as permit cons permanent conservation wouldn't have been possible without them. Please consider your own catalyst or spark that inspires you to engage in con conservation as well. We need to continue to grow, re-energize, and respond to opportunities that help us achieve our mission to conserve the natural legacy of Wisconsin for everyone forever. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our board chair, Bruce Siebold. Good afternoon and welcome on behalf of the Landmark Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you to the annual meeting. We have a great agenda ahead of you. And I wanna first introduce myself, I've been on the board now for five years two years as uh, the chair, and it's one of the most exciting boards that I truly have been on. The people on it are well-equipped and I have a passion for the preserving the land and the culture and the, and the future for our land across Northwest Wisconsin. Let me take you to, through the agenda. The, it's short, we, we uh, trialed it last week and it's gonna take a, about an hour so please hang in there if you can with some questions and answers at the end. Uh, the first part of it will be the financial and operation update by Michelle Von Ruden, uh, followed by the conservation report by Rick Remington. An exciting uh, presentation by Craig Thompson on the importance of land protection for bird conservation. Uh, Kristen Thompson, our advancement director, will follow up with the advancement update and then the Q&A after that. Next slide, please. Well, here's the people that do all the heavy lifting uh, for Landmark on the staff side. You'll see that has not changed this past year. There's still 10 people on board. Two years ago, we added several new people, but these are the people that are in the trenches doing the work every day. On the right-hand side, you'll see the uh, board of directors. You see the executive committee on top and they had large members down below. One major change that's taken place on the at-large members is that Susan Denicio has put her time in for over 10 to 12 years. She's been a board member and she has now left us a fantastic board member. And Sue, if you're out there, we miss you and love you. Um, come on back soon if you can. So, um, and then the other new board members, Andy Bacanaro who is a finance investment advisor who does a great job helping with our finance uh, committee. So we got a lot of good things that have done. And one of the big things we're gonna be doing this upcoming year, and this is gonna strike fear in every one of the staff members and also the board of directors because we're going to relook at strategic planning this year. That's a, it's about every three years we come back, revisit it, make sure we're on the right direction and look at three to five years ahead to see where we need to go. So that will be taking place as one of our big projects for this upcoming year. So uh, we have a, a lot to go and I'm excited to introduce uh, Michelle Von Ruden, who will talk us about the finance. Oh, excuse me, I forgot one thing. I'm, my notes are wrong. One of the biggest, this is shame on me, one of the biggest decisions we made this year as a board of directors was to hire a new executive director. And we cast the net far, thanks to the governance committee made up of, of Catherine Merrill and a lot of heavy work by Genevieve Johnson to look who was gonna be our next executive director. Uh, a lot of applications, we did a lot of reviews, background checks, 
interviewed uh, candidates and we found it was a unanimous decision on the part of our board members last year that Rick Remington would become the next executive director. We we're so glad to get that interim name off his title and he is our executive director, hopefully for years to come. I believe we're in very, very good hands with Rick as our executive director. So I'm now I'm gonna turn over to Michelle, take it away on the finance. Thank you, Bruce. Tonight I will be giving an update on our statement of financial position, the watershed endowments and operations. Slide. Thank you. As you can see, our $14,521,632 for our balance sheet. The bulk of that's coming from our conservation land at over $11 million. We have, our investments are improving almost back up to $2 million. And um, our total liabilities this time around is, are only $64,000. So that's really good. Um, Overall, our balance sheet continues to be strong and is encouraging for both staff and board members alike. Slide. Looking at our income chart, you'll see most of our income comes from individual contributions. We also had a bequest that helped boost our cash flow during the fiscal year. We are so thankful for those who plan to give an estate gift after their passing. Throughout the fiscal year, we had on average five months of operating reserves, which is a little less than what we typically like to see. We like to be in that six to nine month range. However, LTA standards only require three to six months. So we're still in a good financial position um, and we're gonna keep working towards increasing that. And we do in track all of our restricted funds that come in, as you can see on the right-hand side here. We're carrying roughly 193,000 forward to this fiscal year but the bulk of that being brownstone. And you'll see there's $41,000 in board restricted. And that is part of our legacy campaign. Um, and so when we get a new legacy donor, we are able to transfer money from board restricted into our account. So we do have that match going on right now as well. Slide please. Last year, if you remember, I discussed the difference between our endowments and this year, I want to introduce you to our new watershed approach. We operate within three major watersheds, the Chippewa River Watershed, St. Croix River Watershed, and Lake Superior Watershed. Our goal is to have an endowment for each watershed, which will allow us to manage all the properties within it. And what that means is the funds can be used for general operating purposes, land management, land acquisition, trail building, and so on. This also provides an opportunity for you our donors to give in your backyard. I am happy to announce that we were able to create the Triple River Watershed prior to the end of the fiscal year with the Eau Claire Community Foundation. Our goal for this year is to create the Lake Superior Watershed, which covers over 11,000 acres. If you're interested in helping us meet that goal, please reach out to Kristen Thompson, our Advancement Director. Slide, please. Some of you may recall from last year's annual meeting that our accreditation status was up for renewal. I'm happy to announce that it was approved. As you can see from this slide, that means we have sound financial practices. We conduct ourselves ethically. We are responsible in the way that we handle ourselves as an organization. And we are creating lasting stewardship, which, you know, that's the whole reason why we're here, right, is to create that lasting stewardship. This reaccreditation is in effect for the next five years. So thank you to everyone who helped get this done last year. It was a huge project, um, but we made it through. And as we look at things with the LTA, our goal is to continue to continually to align ourselves with best practices and LTA standards. Again, our goal is to align ourselves with best practices and LTA standards. This includes our job titles. So this year we took a look at where we were at with our titles. And we are starting off with three title upgrades. This was in part due to the work they are doing and what they have shown that they can do. Charlie Kearns was the conservation assistant and he is now our conservation specialist. Sarah Norman, she was the community outreach coordinator and she is now our community engagement manager. And Angie Anderson Norberg, our administrative associate is now our operations coordinator. 
Congratulations to all three of you and thank you for your hard work. And last but not least is the audit. When we hired Bauman Associates, our goal was to have our audit completed, presented, and approved at our October board meeting. We met that challenge last year and we are on track to do it again this year. In closing, I want you, our donors, volunteers, and partners to understand that we truly appreciate your gifts of time, service, and funding. And we cannot complete our mission without you. Thank you. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rick to discuss our conservation program. Thanks, Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rick Remington. I'm the executive director. Uh, before I give the conservation report for fiscal year 22-23, uh, I just want to say um, a few words about my new position um, and what an honor and a privilege it is to be serving as Landmark's next executive director. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces and names on the call uh, this afternoon, and uh, some of you have known for many years. For those of you that don't know me, uh, I've been around Landmark a long time, um, and I'd just like to say I'm really proud of the accomplishments this organization has done because of the hard work of the staff, the board, that includes current and past, uh, and folks like all of you, along with our partners and supporters across the state. Um, I'm looking forward to learning my new role. That includes getting out, meeting people, engaging with partners, and also working with the best group of coworkers uh, that a fellow could ask for, as long as as well as the uh, the best board of directors a guy could ask for as well. Uh, so again, thank you, and let's talk about uh, let's talk about conservation. Um, so when I talk about Landmark's uh, conservation program, we're talking about the three main facets of that program, uh, meaning conservation easement stewardship, land management, and land protection. I never want to talk about land protection and conservation without uh, bringing up our big, beautiful dot map, as we like to call it. Um, again, for those of you that might be oh, new to our to Landmark family or new to our work, phone. Landmark works in a 20-county area of northwest Wisconsin, from the shores of Lake Superior all the way south to Wisconsin's third Great Lake, which is Lake Pepin on the Mississippi River, and everything in between. Uh, it encompasses close to a quarter of the state of Wisconsin and has lakes, right. rivers, prairies, wetlands, sedge meadows, bluffs, farms, forests, and everything in between. And so it's our charge to figure out what's the most important and unique areas uh, to try to set aside or protect or manage in some way. I never wanna get a group of people together without first starting out talking about conservation easements and conservation easement stewardship. Um, many of you on the call know that a conservation right. easement is one big part of our work. What? But let's talk just a second about what a conservation easement is. A conservation easement is a legal document. It's a legal agreement between a land trust like us and a private landowner that limits or restricts the use of property in perpetuity. So it no longer could be used for, for instance, a subdivision or a commercial development or commercial housing, or the trees can't be clear cut, or it can't be turned into you know, a confined animal feeding operation. There are any number of restrictions we can put on land that are baked into a conservation easement to protect what's ecologically important about it. Landmark currently holds 22,000 or 2200, two, excuse me, 223 conservation easements comprising about 27,000 acres. For you uh, spatially aware people, that is roughly the size of a uh, one six by six mile township under conservation easement. So the tip of the spear with our conservation easement stewardship program is annual monitoring. This is where we literally go out and physically inspect every single one of those 223 properties on that 27,000 acres across our 20 county service area. We do so with the help of 20 volunteers, which is comprised of you know, folks like yourself on the call, as well as several of our board of directors who do about 75 visits to uh, those easement properties, about a third or so. That helps our staff capacity tremendously. And we can focus on the next phase, which is stewardship administration. If you think about monitoring as the tip of the spear or the tip of the iceberg, it's just the beginning. After monitoring, there's any number of questions and issues that arise as we try to 
help landowners, uh, new and old, stay in compliance with those conservation easement documents and making sure the conservation values are being upheld. That include uh, a review and approval of building plans, uh, restoration plans, agricultural plans, forest management plans. There are divisions of property that occur. There are sales of property from one individual to next, all under the guise of the conservation easement. And so that's kind of where the real work begins is after the monitoring stops. And again, the, uh, the ability to have staff in-house to be able to do that next phase of stewardship is invaluable uh, and, and necessary to have those volunteers on the ground aiding us. The next thing I'd like to talk about is land management. That's a little bit easier for folks to grapple with because many of you are, are landowners or know people that own property. You don't just set it aside and walk away and it takes care of itself. Well, it's the same with Landmark's uh, 22 nature preserves uh, comprising about 2,700 acres. All those properties that we own and manage are not managed equally, nor are they similar size. The smallest is about an acre and the largest is almost 600 acres. Some are managed very intensively and some are managed barely at all. And again, everything in between. Just a few of the main facets of that management include uh, planning and implementation uh, uh, for public access. That includes things like parking, trails, signage, and making sure that people's visitation and use of property is not harmful to the resource and leaves them having a good conservation or outdoor experience. The next facet would be ecological management or restoration as we like to call it. Could be anything from prescribed fire to removing invasive species to tree planting and things of that nature. Community engagement isn't really the charge of our conservation team, which is comprised of, uh, of Erica Lang, Andrew Norman, Katie Hahn, and Charlie Kearns. And if they'll let me continue to play in the conservation arena, myself as well. Uh, but community engagement is really uh, housed under our advancement team, which it, you'll hear more about later from Kristen, but includes uh, Kristen Thompson, Sarah Norman, and Zariah Whitaker. Um, Conservation works in tandem with our advancement team and planning for community engagement, uh, as whether that includes things like invasive species, work days, hikes, and things like that. You can't manage land without administration. Um, I think back to a, uh, a joke I used to pass around to coworkers of um, two pictures. And one was a picture of, uh, of a guy out in the woods hugging a tree, I think it was. And it said, what my wife thinks I do at work. And the other picture was a guy sitting behind a desk piled with paper and it said something like uh, what I really do at work. Well, that's kind of how it is in our world. No, we do get to go outside and hug trees once in a while, but there's a lot of administration involved as well, which includes planning, securing funding sources, reporting on grants and things like that. So we never get away from the desk work or the admin. Um, I wanna echo a little bit of what Michelle said a minute ago on sustainable funding. Um, you know, the more Landmark can plan for the management of its own properties now and future properties we might secure in the future, uh, the more we can plan for sustainable funding of managing those areas, the more time we can actually spend managing them. You know, a, a fair amount of our time is spent, you know, figuring out what we want to do and then figuring out how the heck we're able to uh, find the dollars and resources to actually do it. So again, those watershed endowment funds in order to help care for our properties is going to be invaluable moving forward. So I couldn't resist including this slide and I'm not going to uh, go into too much uh, uh, gory detail talking about the data, but uh, we've been collecting trail data on just a few of our uh, uh, nature preserves to learn about the numbers of people that are using them so we can plan for future use and management. A couple of those are the Devil's Punch Bowl and Brownstone Trail. You'll hear more about both these properties um, in a few minutes. Devil's Punch Bowl is one of our smallest properties. It's three acres um, and it's about three or four miles from our office in Menominee. Similarly, the Brownstone Trail is a narrow ribbon of land. It's a trail. It's a trail two miles long that begins in the city of Bayfield and goes south along Lake Superior for a couple miles. So, you know, very small properties, 
but very intensive use. And I just want to point out a couple things. Um, that choppy green line on the devil's punch bowl is an indication that use goes up and down throughout the year. Now we've only been doing this for about a year and a half, I think. So our data is getting more exciting as every year passes. But that green choppy line indicates people are in and out of there all week long, all year long, um, depending on the weather and depending what's occurring there. In the summer to get out of the sun and cool off at the bottom of our little rocky amphitheater. Uh, in the winter is to see the icicles. The Brownstone Trail is a little different. Uh, there's a huge peak in spring, fall, and summer, but you can see that trough there in January means it's awfully cold and snowy in Bayfield and folks are not out on the Brownstone Trail. Um, the pie chart, also interesting. About half the people that visit the Punch Bowl do so on a weekend, whereas the Brownstone Trail gets equal use all week long. Probably the most interesting statistic before I move on is when you look at average daily traffic of those sites and you do the math and you have to kind of do a little little uh, monkey business with the numbers because the devil's punch bowl double counts people coming in and out because there's one way in and one way out. But when you do the math, there's roughly equal visitation to both those properties in excess of 20,000 people a year. Now, 20,000 20, people walking on the Brownstone Trail doesn't surprise me. 20,000 people or more in the bottom of the punch bowl throughout the year is, uh, is amazing. And um, it's something that is both alarming and amazing because we have to figure out how to let all those people use and enjoy it and have a positive outdoor experience without destroying the place. Um, so that's where these numbers come into play. Those are the challenge, but there's also um, some interesting opportunities with those numbers. With 20,000 plus visitors, just imagine if every one of those folks, or even a fraction of them, threw a dollar or $10 or $100 towards Landmark Conservancy to help us manage it. Now there's a huge impact. Now think about if every single one of those 20 or 25,000 people ran into a sign on the property, well, not literally, uh, had a brochure and left that property understanding the work of Landmark Conservancy, understanding the importance of land protection, learned something about the area and about the conservation values associated with the punch bowl or Lake Superior shoreline and actually learned something. Now there's an impact that is invaluable. And that's where I think understanding these numbers really tells us that we need to be making sure we try to reach these numbers or at least part of them to the extent we can. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of the management uh, tasks, if you will, or properties that we focused on over the past fiscal year. Uh, we talked about the Mary Fitz Park last year. So this 80 acre preserve is uh, about five minutes south of Eau Claire. Um, so it's very easily reached from all those folks living in the Chippewa Valley. Um, it was formerly a pine plantation in an old agricultural field, and we've been in the process over the past maybe five to seven years or so, uh, recreating a prairie uh, across the landscape there. This is our second prescribed fire we've executed. We're seeing really good results. We have a few challenges there, which is to be expected of any prairie restoration in its infancy. Uh, and we're looking forward into transitioning the fire break eventually into a trail system along with, again, parking and signage and, and other ways to reach out to people to educate them about the value of grassland habitat. So expect more from the FITS as time marches forward. Here's the punch bowl we talked about. So you're looking at pretty much all of it right there. That's three acres. Uh, you could see our new welcome sign, along with uh, Sarah Norman and myself, along with our friends from uh, XL Energy and Dunn Energy Co-op who helped us uh, pay for and install a new sign on site. Again, educating people about Landmark Conservancy, about the value of land protection, and about the conservation values they can expect to see on site. It's a pretty simple message. It's not overly complicated and is left to people, left to uh, make people feeling that they've learned something but not overwhelmed. You can also see the new boulders around the parking area because with all those people coming there to park, we have to find some way to contain them. I think we're probably kind of caught up at the punch bowl, but again, with that many visitors, we need to continually try to plan for 
visitor traffic and steer them into places that are uh, less ecologically significant. But uh, I would say 150 or so miles south or north in Ashland County is probably our flagship nature preserve at 598, uh, 590 acres. It's our largest nature preserve and that's Tyler Forks Community Forest. Uh, this was adjacent to Copper Falls State Park. And so since its acquisition or inception, we've been working closely with folks uh, at the state park to incorporate trails on our property that will allow connectivity between the state-owned land and the landmark-owned property as well. We're also boosting climate resilience through planting of trees. And you can see the installation of a new boardwalk on site to cross wetlands that we did in partnership with uh, folks from the town of Morse. So again, another great partnership illustration at Tyler Forks. Next, we have Lincoln Community Forest, about a half hour or so, uh, maybe 40 minutes south of Bayfield, up in Bayfield County. Now I mentioned Landmark owns about 22 nature preserves or 22 properties. This one is an exception, uh, a great exception. This property actually has its own friends group. So it's the only landmark conservancy preserve that has a built-in friends group that aids us in watching the property and managing the property. And that's the Friends of the Lincoln Community Forest. Over the past couple of years, they spearheaded uh, an idea to build a new boardwalk to, to Mickinac Lake. Um, technically, the construction of it may have occurred in our, our current fiscal year and not prior to our June fiscal year ending, but I know a heck of a lot of planning and coordination went into uh, obtaining the funds and planning the construction of that beautiful boardwalk to the lake there. You can see the folks from uh, Wiscorp, young individuals there who helped build it along with Friends of Lincoln uh, volunteers. So a big hats off to our friends at the Friends of Lincoln. You're gonna get probably sick of me saying this, but it happens a lot anytime I am publicly speaking. And it's really trying to, um, you know, I wanna tell people what Landmark is doing, but I also wanna tell them who's doing it for us or with us. And that's our partners and our partnerships at all levels. Um, just a couple snapshots here of the different levels of partners that we see in land management and land protection in every facet of our organization. We got the corporate level there with Xcel Energy uh, doing, a doing a restoration work day or, or Xcel Energy volunteers are out there cutting brush with us on our Mary Dean Barron's property, um, along with other you know, corps that support our work in different ways like Gun Energy Co-op, Rail Credit Union, things like that. We have government agencies like Wisconsin DNR helping execute prescribed fire on a couple of our nature preserves that are around, near, and adjacent to uh, existing state natural areas. But that list of government partners uh, goes well beyond the DNR um, to Wisconsin Coastal Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Dunn County, Bayfield County, Douglas County, Town of Morris, Town of Red Cedar, Town of Menominee, Town of Union. Um, I'm going to forget some, and so don't be offended if I forget your favorite municipality or your favorite government, government agency, but there's a lot of them that we receive varying levels of, of management assistance from. The last group, and I've called out a couple of them already, I think is, um, is our nonprofit partners. This is a, again, a work day, work day out at Mary Dean Barron's with the uh, Lower Chippewa River Alliance, um, a friends group of the Lower Chippewa River, if you will. Um, but again, there's, there's a million and one nonprofits that aid or volunteer with us or complement our work uh, including the Prairie Enthusiasts, Beaver Creek Reserve, Bayfield Area Trails, Friends of North Pikes Creek, and I could go on uh, all night uh, if I thought about it and had an alphabetical list in front of me. So again, partnership at all levels. The last major part of our conservation program, if you will, is land protection. Everybody likes to hear about uh, new land protection um, projects. So Landmark operates on a fiscal year. It starts July 1 and it ends in June 30th. And so when we're reporting on accomplishments, whether they be financial accomplishments or land protection accomplishments, we're looking at that 12 month period in that fiscal year. Well, as my coworkers in conservation can attest, uh, land protection does not operate on a perfect fiscal year. 
you know, things take forever sometimes. They take multiple fiscal years. And so things we are starting today, I hope you all will he be here to hear about in two or three years. Um, but that's the length of good land protection and how long it takes sometimes. This year, we're talking about six completed projects totaling just shy of 500 acres. We're also working on a heck of a lot more than that. We're wrapping up these accomplishment projects and transitioning them into that land management phase. Uh, we're also onboarding new projects and constantly receiving inquiries and deciding what we have the capacity to take on. Always looking for that sweet spot between how much new land we can protect and how we can do a good job of stewarding it once we have it. So here's just a couple slides of our land protection projects this year. Uh, way up in Douglas County, we have Bergen Springs Bog. Uh, inside the office, we have a name of Barnes Bog for the uh, conservation easement donor, uh, Francie Barnes, who donated a conservation easement on this beautiful property uh, with a pristine bog lake built in with carnivorous plants and upland barrens. The coolest thing about the Northwest Sands uh, ecological landscape that this is part of is that you can have things like sphagnum bogs and bog lakes and carnivorous plants that are literally a stone's throw from places that you would manage with prescribed fire, oak jack pine barrens. Uh, so you have all that diversity packed into small areas and that's pretty typical of what you find in the, in the uh, less developed parts of the Northwest barrens. Uh, Bergen Springs bogs, by the way, uh, drains southward into the Totentech River, which is one of our state's uh, few uh, designated wild rivers. So it's imperative to keeping that river quality high, also a tributary to the St. Croix. Next project I wanna talk about is uh, one of our smaller ones for the year, but that doesn't mean it wasn't important. Uh, the Big Ravine addition was 10 acres and part of uh, an existing Big Ravine complex. You can see that large gray scar on the map that cuts from the north all the way down to the blue in the corner, which is the city of Bayfield and Lake Superior. So the Big Ravine complex is a complex of protected land that Landmark has done and its predecessor organization, Bayfield Regional Conservancy, in partnership with the township. So we have secured trail easements, we have secured conservation easements, and this new addition to that pr protects the very headwaters of Big Ravine. It's dramatically different on the 10 acre headwaters property than what you would find if you started walking down ravine or down slope towards the city of Bayfield where it's primarily forested with an intact forest canopy and very steep topography. The property way up on top here where the headwaters are is flat and consists of uh, ponds and beaver wetlands. Adds a lot of diversity to that trail system uh, in partnership with the township as well as with Bayfield area trails and the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Program and a grant, a grant from US Fish and Wildlife Service. So a very complicated project as they all uh, tend to be. Um, a little bit south in Sawyer County, this is probably about 10 miles from Hayward or so, what we call the Spider Lake Forest. Um, Kristen mentioned uh, catalysts and change makers. Um, and any one of these projects that I have talked about so far this evening, including some of the land management, um, is typically started by, a, by an individual or a small group of individuals um, who has an idea or who sparks an interest in somebody else. And that's what happened here uh, when Jim and Kate Weinert, the former owners of this property, were in a conversation with a neighbor about how to protect the spider chain of lakes and talks about what Jim and Kate might do with uh, their 200 plus acres of forest someday and how that might be better served to protect it than to just sell it um, in order to protect the water quality of the lake. Recognizing the importance of the spider chain, you know, we jumped at the opportunity, but I think it's even more uh, fun is in the conservation arena, we love maps and we love to peel back the layers of the onion and discover not only what's important on the surface, but um, what else is ecologically important about the property. Certainly the spider chain is, uh, I recognize that right away as one of our most notable water resources in the state. Um, and the protection of the forest is integral to the protection of that water resource. That was kind of a no brainer 
But in looking closer, it's also part of the, o the Owen Teal Forest Important Bird Area, IBA, as we like to call them, the Owen Teal IBA, which is an intact uh, interior forest canopy forest that stretches uh, across a couple counties, has hummocky sphagnum topography, bogs, ephemeral wetlands, um, and is also part of the Rock Lake and Moraine Conservation Opportunity Area, another awesome area that is mapped by the state of Wisconsin. And so all these different overlapping protection priorities start to materialize when you start laying, one, laying them over each other um, on a map. And so that's what kind of gets our conservation team really excited about seeing the protection of these properties. Lost Creek Headwaters, you're gonna, you're gonna say I sound like a broken record, but again, it popped. You know, when we saw this and my coworker Erica Lang in conversations with folks from Bayfield County, uh, the red, the little, the little polygon you see in the bottom right corner of the map in red there is the subject property. It's 160 acres. Uh, of our newest acquisition last year. Um, and we did it in partnership with the county and with Wisconsin Coastal Management. Upon acquisition, we immediately transferred ownership to Bayfield County and they will manage it consistently with all of that green land that you see surrounding it, which is part of the Bayfield uh, County Forest. As you work your way down Lost Creek, and I believe this is Lost Creek number one, there's also Lost Creek number two and three, on the map as well. But as you work your way down Lost Creek number one, you encounter uh, several more landmark, former landmark projects, uh, conservation easements and, and conveyances to the state of Wisconsin. When you get a little further towards the lake, you encounter the yellowish color, which is the state of Wisconsin holdings, which is the Lost Creek Bog State Natural Area. So you start talking about connectivity and I know that the Lost Creek Bog State Natural Area is part of the South Shore Wetlands IBA, another important bird area. And you start looking at the connectivity and that builds value from uh, connecting properties together when we can uh, try to string more than one together instead of having isolated or random acts of conservation. Moving further south, I guess we're going pretty much uh, north to south here is Elk Creek Bottoms in Eau Claire. This is about 20 miles uh, from our office in Menominee and maybe about five to, five to 10 minutes from, uh, from the city of Eau Claire. Um, Elk Creek Bottoms, so you're looking at the top of a bluff at uh, looking down the lower Chippewa River. And so you're saying, well, where's the bottoms? Where's the wetlands? Well, this is at the confluence of Elk Creek and the Chippewa River. Um, where Elk Creek meets the Chippewa River, back floods every year, and trust me, there's significant wetlands in and along uh, Elk Creek when the Chippewa River back floods. But there's also a 150 foot or so bluff that towers over the Chippewa River um, and has an astounding view whether you're looking at it in the summer or winter. Back to the overlapping priority areas, we have the Lower Chippewa River important bird area, the Lower Chip Land Legacy Place, a number of different you know, state designations or state plans. Um, and the lower chip is, is notable for having you know, more diversity packed into any comparable sized area in the state of Wisconsin. So it really popped for our staff when we looked at it, especially in terms of climate uh, diversity and climate resilience and what exists on that property. I think what makes this property even more fun or this project, I should say more fun, um, is the group we worked with to protect it. So we did acquire it with a bargain sale from, with a Knowles Nelson Stewardship Grant from another nonprofit. We acquired the property from the Midwest Institute of Scandinavian Culture, uh, a small nonprofit based out of the Chippewa Valley with a mission to uh, remember and understand and appreciate Nordic, Nordic culture. They owned this property for about 60 years but before deciding it was time for them to transition it uh, to the next owner. And when they thought about you know, their mission and certainly every nonprofit always needs you know, funds to accomplish its mission, they decided it was more important to do a, a bargain sale to Landmark and see the property made publicly available forever. It meshed with their understanding of the Nordic tradition, Almensretten. Uh, Almensretten means every man's right to roam or every person's right to explore natural areas. 
which is a, a Nordic tradition, I think, in uh, Sweden, Norway, and some of the Nordic countries. So I'm proud to say we'll be able to uh, continue the tradition of Almens Retten here at Elk Creek Bottoms. Last property I wanna talk about, and then I'm getting ready to transition to the next part of our program is Brownstone Trail. So I mentioned it initially with the, uh, the numbers of uh, 20,000 plus visitors, and I got a feeling that's probably an underestimate, uh, but we secured a, a very important piece of property along the Brownstone Trail. Um, upslope, we bought an adjacent uh, commercial piece of property that is going to be instrumental in our trail restoration efforts going forward. That's all I'm gonna say about that right now because my coworker, Kristen Thompson, is gonna talk about that in a few minutes. But Brownstone Trail um, was our smallest project last year, but it was probably our biggest in terms of impact. Uh, and it took a lot of staff time and it took every one of uh, myself and my coworker involved in it, especially Erica Lang. So that's what that's last year. Let's take just a peek ahead because everybody likes to get excited about things coming over the horizon. Uh, lower left, some of you who pay attention to our website or get our e-news, and I think you all do, uh, may have heard about Plover Beach. Uh, Plover Beach is 192 acres in Douglas County uh, with a half a mile stretch on Lake Superior. Uh, we did a campaign uh, to aid the Department of Natural Resources in securing this property. We also were integral with uh, negotiations between the seller and Department of Natural Resources, and we'll continue to work right alongside DNR up until closing later this fall. Um, there aren't many stretches along Lake Superior where you can, in one acquisition, protect a half a mile of property. And this is something to be really excited about now and when it eventually happens this fall. This will then be managed as part of the Brule River State Forest. Um, on the other side of, this, of the, my screen, you see a very different project. It's about uh, an hour and a half to two hours south in northern Chippewa County, and that's McCann Creek. This is a little different project for us. Usually Landmark is buying land and transitioning it to another owner, like the state of Wisconsin or a county government. In this case, this property was bought by our partners last year, Pheasants Forever. Uh, the Pheasants Forever State Organization as well as the uh, local chapter, which is the Chippewa Valley chapter of Pheasants Forever. Bought this with a Nose Nelson grant. It's 182 acres, I think, um, along with assistance from the National Wild Turkey Federation, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and uh, Chippewa County, and private fundraising. So again, patching together five to six different sources of funds to secure this property not only for grassland bird habitat, which you don't necessarily see here, uh, but for protection of McCann Creek, which is a class one trout stream. I'm excited because this is exactly like the trout streams I fished growing up, which have alder banks and a sandy bottom. So it gives me kind of a sense of, uh, of home when I think about going there. Pine Coulee is one that is not close to being done and not done at all. Uh, Pine Coulee is a project that's probably about the halfway point. So we're, we're right in the trenches right now. Um, this is going to be a landmark acquisition about as far west as you can go in Wisconsin or in our service area. It's at the very confluence of the St. Croix River and the Mississippi River. And it's a 76 acre property, uh, half in the city of Prescott and half in the township. So it's a very rapidly developing area about 20 minutes or so from St. Paul, Minnesota. So you can tell the kinds of development pressure one might expect to see when you're 20 minutes from St. Paul. The property has been visited by uh, residents and visitors to the area um, historically for probably, you know, 100, 150, who knows how many years. You know, years ago, who owned land wasn't important. If something was cool, you could go there and visit it. You could paint it. You could picnic. Well, that doesn't happen today, but we're very fortunate to have a, a sympathetic seller who's willing to work with Landmark and give us the time, along with our partners, which I'll mention in a second, uh, to secure this property. And you know, we've secured about half the funds through a grant from the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Program, an extremely important source of funding that I hope everybody pays attention to and advocates for. Um, for $460,000, we are about halfway there. So we have significant funds to raise yet. Kristen's gonna talk a little more about this, but um, 
uh, I couldn't pass the opportunity to at least set the stage for her a little bit. So I think I'm at the end of my conservation report. I'm gonna take a quick sip, quick sip of water and I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Final word for me on conservation. Um, stay tuned folks, uh, it's exciting. You know, we're excited to come in to work every day. We never know what the next phone call is going to yield. Um, and I think you can expect to see more of the same great work in the future. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Craig Thompson here before I turn uh, the screen over to him. Craig started working for the Department of Natural Resources when gas was 86 cents a gallon. Over the past 30 years, he's held a variety of positions with the department, specializing in migratory bird conservation and protected areas management. He currently serves as Chief of Program Integration for the DNR's Natural Heritage Conservation Program. Craig has a clinical obsession with birding in the tropics, especially during Wisconsin's chilly winters. So I've known Craig for, I don't know how many years, a long time. Um, he's the guy with the binoculars on the left. I'm the guy obviously with the landmark uh, name tag. Birders always have binoculars and I always have my landmark uh, name tag. I've known Craig a long time and um, I think everybody's gonna love what he has to say. Um, one thing I can say, we mentioned again, catalysts and change makers. I can honestly say that uh, every time I hear Craig speak and every time I talk to him, on the phone or in person or even exchanging emails, I leave energized about what I do and I see more value in what Landmark is doing. Um, he also reminds me always to celebrate our accomplishments. It's really easy to keep looking over the next hill, next hill and want more, but Craig is always one to say, great job guys, and, uh, and recognize and celebrate our accomplishments. So that, with that, I'll turn it over to my good friend, Craig. Thank you, Rick, for that generous introduction. It's great to be with all of you tonight. I just, uh, to turn the tables on Rick a little bit, I just want to say congratulations at, on your selection as executive director. That is not only good for Landmark, but it's also great for conservation in the state of Wisconsin as a whole. So uh, Rick, we're delighted, and I look forward to many years of working with you and uh, collaboratively on conservation in the great state of Wisconsin. I also wanna say special thanks to Sarah Norman for providing the opportunity to speak to all of you this evening. And I wanna thank Zariah Whitaker for her efforts to choreograph tonight's annual meeting, which by the way, is no small task. So again, very happy to be here. What I'm going to do is provide what I would characterize as a crisp conversation or a crisp presentation on what's going on in the world of birds and how Landmark is directly impacting that. So the first part, and so this is pretty short, it's succinct. The first part is a rather sobering characterization of what's happening to our beloved birds, but it ends with a note of hope and inspiration in regard to the remarkably important conservation work that Landmark Conservancy is doing and how that translates directly to bird conservation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Landmark Conservation is in, Landmark Conservancy is indeed for the birds. Next slide, please. So what's going on in the world of birds, you ask? Well, there's a great deal that's going on, much of which is giving us great concern. Birds are literally disappearing. What we're finding is there simply aren't as many birds as there used to be a number of decades ago. And we have actually been able to quantify that. Next slide. So if we look at what's gone on bird-wise in terms of population trends, we know that since 1970, we have lost about 3 billion individual birds. That is by any measure considered to be significant and it really in regard to some species, a catastrophic loss. How do we know this? Because every year a group of biologists fan out across North America and conduct what are known as breeding bird surveys. They have a rigorous protocol in that the same routes are traveled every year and the same procedures are used to tally birds either by sight or by sound. And we have been able to take through, through powerful computers and sophisticated logarithm, al algorithms, we have been able to 
crunch all of that data that has been accumulating since 1966. We truncated it at 1970 just for purposes of data analysis and synthesize all of that and analyze it. And, and what came out the end of the pipe was indeed eye-opening it because we knew there were bird losses going on. We had no idea of the magnitude of the loss. So about 3 billion birds since 1970, that's about a third of all the birds that occur in North America. Next slide. If we look according to categories, we can see widespread declines for birds associated with certain types of broad biomes or habitat types. So starting on the left side of this slide, Eastern deciduous forest birds, things like wood thrush, eastern wood peewee, rose-breasted grosbeak, and scarlet tanager are down about 20%. Uh, Arctic tundra birds are taking a whooping simply because the Arctic is warming so quickly. Western forest birds are down. And of course, every year we hear about these raging catastrophic project level fires out west that's having an enormous impact on the availability of habitat. Boreal birds across one of the largest expanses of boreal forest in the world up in Canada are down more than a third. Shorebirds are down almost 40%. And perhaps most disturbingly, uh, many of our favorite birds, the grassland associated species like bobolinks and eastern meadowlarks, dick sissels, and a variety of sparrows are down by more than 53%. In fact, when I was growing up, and I suspect it's the same for many of you, Eastern meadowlarks used to be abundant. I saw them everywhere. They were even in interchanges within uh, the, the interstate system as you were pulling on and off the freeway. To find a pair of bobolinks anymore is actually noteworthy and it's a big deal. And to find more than one pair is significant. So we are up against some strong conservation headwinds as it relates to the losses of grassland birds and trying to address those losses. Next slide, please. A little closer to home, just to illustrate what I mean, if you take a look at some of our more common backyard birds, some of the species we love to see every spring and summer, our orioles, our rose-breasted grosbeaks, our blue jays, all have declined somewhat significantly. Blue jays down 25%, Baltimore orioles down 33%. Our dark-eyed juncos, one of those common species we see in feeders and backyards during the winter, uh, down 33%. And the lovely little white-throated sparrow, which has that mnemonic, that's that little song that you hear every morning in the fall and the spring, by the way. So this is a species that breeds up in northern Wisconsin, I'm sure on some landmark properties and widely across boreal Canada, heads south through Wisconsin every fall. They don't typically spend the winter here. A few of them are foolish enough to try to make it in the winter, and somehow they typically do, but most go to the southern United States. But as they're transiting north and south, you hear that little Oh, Canada, Canada, Canada call that they make. And it's just a lovely part of the spring and fall bird migration ritual, down 33%. We don't want our forest to become silent. So we positively must do something in a very significant way to respond to these losses. Well, what you might ask is actually conspiring to drive bird numbers down. Next slide, please. Habitat loss is the primary driver and we're seeing it go on everywhere and not just here in Wisconsin where many of these species spend their breeding season, but also throughout the hemispheric ranges for these birds that are considered to be long distance migrants. So for instance, bobolinks, which we love to hear the little bubbly gurgle of bobolinks in hay fields and, and prairies across Wisconsin every summer, that's a species that winters down in Argentina, almost a 6,000 mile journey each way. And what's going on down in Argentina on their wintering grounds is of comparable concern to what's happening here in terms of habitat loss. The same is true for cerulean warblers, which spend the winter, which winter, which, excuse me, which breed in big blocks of forest here in Wisconsin on some landmark properties, I'm sure, but spend the winter in the coffee grown regions high in the Andes of Northern South America. And because there's so much forest clearing going on, we're seeing that species decline precipitously. So what we have are, is a situation where we actually need to work across birds' hemispheric ranges as it relates to designing conservation strategies for these 
far-flung neotropical migrants. So habitat loss is the primary driver across their range, but there are other factors that are conspiring to also help drive numbers down. Number two being window collisions. So we are estimating that as birds collide with windows, both on their breeding grounds during migration and on their wintering grounds, we're probably losing about a billion birds a year. And the number three factor is outdoor cats. And I'm not gonna go into great detail on any of these other than to say cats are lovely animals, but they are better off for both wildlife and for the welfare of the cat inside the house as opposed to outside in the yard. About half a million to 750, excuse me, about 500 million to 750 million birds a year estimated to be taken by outdoor cats. These sources of, of uh, impacts to bird populations are something that we absolutely have control over. So as it relates to habitat loss, what are we doing? Next slide, please. Well, this is where things get really great and inspiring. And literally it's landmark conservancy to the rescue because what I can testify to is most of the things, in fact, virtually all of the activities that landmark is undertaking, whether direct land protection or outreach or partnership building, all of those things are having a positive impact on birds and none too soon. Next slide, please. So what I wanna do is give you three examples Several of, rich, several of which Rick has already highlighted because they speak to how smart Landmark is in terms of pursuing this much needed uh, conservation across portions of Wisconsin that benefit not only our migratory birds, but in fact, all the biota associated with these important sites. And there are, there are a couple of common themes, again, which Rick highlighted because he's a veteran conservationist conservationist Rick gets it. And so you're going to hear me repeat some of these same characteristics and some of these same themes because they're critically important for helping to sustain bird populations. Tyler Forks Community Forest, my gosh, I've never been there. I can't wait to visit, but what a spectacular acquisition. I remember having a conversation with Rick years ago about you know, we talked about how they could possibly pull us off. And I thought, gee whiz, if Landmark can do this, my gosh, everybody's going to be so impressed. Landmark did do it. And we're not only impressed, but grateful. Next slide, please. And why is it so important? It's so important because it's almost 600 acres adjacent to Copper Falls State Park. And to the north, you can see there's another state wildlife area. And what we know from a conservation standpoint is big blocks of habitat are going to be absolutely essential to hang on to breeding bird populations, not individual birds, but entire populations of birds. And so to the extent that Landmark is being strategic by identifying these critically important resources next to, adjacent to, or in proximity to existing protected areas, in this instance, Copper Falls State Park, and securing a future for those birds that, for those habitats that entails permanent protection, they are by, in essence, creating large blocks of habitat, which are critically important for, again, for these breeding species. But from a very broad perspective in terms of ecosystem function, it's only these big anchor conservation units that are ultimately going to matter. 85% of Wisconsin is privately owned. That means private landowners such as yourselves are going to have a significant influence on the complexion of conservation in Wisconsin ultimately. But what we know is these big blocks of protected land are going to serve as the nuclei, the catalyst, the springboard for additional conservation activity around which other things will happen. And with the goal of making conservation as broad across the landscape as possible. So we want geographically expansive protected areas. Next slide, please. Another great example of the smart, important work that Landmark has done is Meridian Barrens in the Chippewa River Bottoms. And Rick has already spoken to the importance of the Lower Chippewa, so I don't need to go over that. But suffice it to say, Wisconsin, as we take a look at all of North America, 
Barren's communities, because of the nature of them being essentially treeless and very dry, have been subject to a variety of pressures no matter where they occur. And it just so happens that Wisconsin is incredibly important for Barron's communities globally. And every acre of Barron's that is protected helps ensure our leadership on the Barron's conservation front. These these almost prairie-like communities have a host of rare species, plant and animal associated with them. And yet they're extremely rare, they're very fragile, they take a lot of management. And so for Landmark to secure another more than 300 acres of barrens, next slide please, within the lower Chippewa River system is just oh so significant. And you can see once again, that this rose colored polygon that is the Meridian Barrens, is actually complementary to and augmentative of an existing protected area down in the lower chip River system. So every additional property that's bought online makes this big block even bigger and thus more important for conservation, not only for birds, but again, for all of the biota, the insects, the reptiles, the amphibians that are associated with these habitats. And because it's big, it's going to have value long-term. It's just easier for us to maintain the ecological, ecological integrity of these large sites. And we're also providing important uh, pu public outdoor recreation opportunities. So, you know, landmark, I hate to use the adage, but two birds with one stone in this instance, it's really quite remarkable. So one more example, which Rick already highlighted, next slide, please. And that is Plover Beach. Oh my gosh. Next, we'll just roll right into the map, please. Next slide a half a mile of undeveloped beach on the south shore of Lake Superior, unheard of. Almost 200 acres on the shoreline adjacent to Brule River State Forest. Goodness gracious, you can't get a better conservation context for an acquisition like this. This is oh so important. And when I first learned of this, I thought, oh my, Landmark is preserving something that's just incredibly important for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is migratory birds. That south shore of Lake Superior acts as a migrant trap. So you get birds that are coming across the lake or traveling along the shoreline of the lake in both spring and fall migration because some birds are just so reluctant to cross that big body of water for good reason, lots of hazards associated with that. To have more secured habitat for those passage migrants moving to and from boreal Canada is critically important. You're probably going to get a variety of shorebirds in addition to the little warblers that are going through. And I have a colleague, perhaps some of you are familiar with a great ornithologist by the name of Ryan Brady, who does a lot of work up in this neck of the woods. And he's regularly finding spectacular concentrations of birds along the Lake Superior shoreline. In a single morning, he counted 750 northern flickers, these big, beautiful woodpeckers that were traveling in a flock along the shoreline. These kinds of purchases, this specific acquisition that Landmark is doing is going to help secure a future for those migratory birds so they don't have to worry about transmission lines and tall towers and, in fact, residences and other kinds of incompatible developments in these critical migratory corridors. So again, wow, I... It's so excited for this. To, I'm so excited for this to happen. I'm glad Rick highlighted it. And again, kudos to Landmark for the incredibly smart conservation they're doing. And so next slide, please. What I can tell you is that Landmark, if we look at from just from a bird perspective, is having such a profound impact. And so if you would click one more forward, please, Zariah. Every red dot here is an important bird area in Wisconsin. And so just to provide some context, we know that all of Wisconsin, generally speaking, is important for birds. We've lost so much habitat that all the remaining habitat is taking on increased significance. But we also know that we don't have the resources to work everywhere. And so a number of years ago, we did a statewide analysis and we said, out of the whole state of Wisconsin, what are the, literally the most important areas for hanging on to not only our resident species, but our wintering species and our migratory species, those species that pass to and from Wisconsin twice a year. We mapped all of them and we identified 93. And you can see by these red dots that landmark using the criteria, many of much of which Rick has already characterized, 
is already working in areas that are considered to be among the most important in Western Wisconsin for our migratory and resident birds. I don't have enough good things to say about Landmark. What I can tell you is I have the good fortune to work with all of the land, con all of the land trusts in the state of Wisconsin. And all of them are trying very hard to do the good work of conservation as rapidly as possible. But it is not an exaggeration to say that Landmark is among the very best. This is a top shelf organization with extraordinary staff that are profoundly dedicated to moving conservation forward in a very strategic, a very smart and a very impactful way. And I see it all the time. And my gosh, what a joy to even have the opportunity to work with all of the landmark staff and to be here with all of you tonight. This is really a reason for celebration. And gosh, you're doing great work. And I'm just excited to continue to work with you. Next slide, please. So I want to say uh, 41,000 acres under your belt. Every single acre of that 41,000 acre total is important for birds. Landmark is having an impact. Landmark will continue to have an impact. And it's seeing the great work that Landmark Conservancy is doing that really gives me hope as within the conservation community we're all confronting. And I consider, by the way, all of you to be members of the conservation community, not just us folks lucky enough to be doing it professionally, but all of you have a role to play, an important role to play, I might add. It's just so inspirational to see what's being done by Landmark throughout Western Wisconsin. And it really puts a smile on my face and it gives me a lot of hope. So next slide, please. So on behalf of Tweety Bird and all his cousins everywhere, thank you Landmark for the terrific work you're doing. I really appreciate it. And I can say on behalf of the entire conservation community, hats off to you. We are so grateful for everything you do. And one more slide, please. And with that, from the Department of Shameless Advertising, I just want to have a, I have a question for the group, which is what grapefruit-sized creature has radically transformed not only the nature, but the pace of conservation? This is a bona fide natural history mystery. And you're going to have to tune in to a special presentation on October 4th to learn more. So thanks to all of you, especially Rick and Sarah and Zariah for the opportunity to speak tonight. It's been a joy and continue to, and, and I appreciate your work and thank you for all you do. So thanks, Rick. Greg, uh, thank you so much. Um, with all those compliments, you're going to give me a big head and you're going to give all of us a big head, but really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, keep it up, man. You inspire us every day. You scare me a little bit when you start giving me statistics, but then you turn around and you give me hope and optimism. So I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody can um, join Craig on October 4th for the virtual presentation um, to get more of this. This is the tip of the iceberg of this gentleman's knowledge. So again, Craig, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, anytime we can do anything for you, for the department, for birds, keep us in mind, we're just a phone call away. So with that, I would like to take you to the last uh, segment here of our program this evening and introduce my coworker, Kristen Thompson, who will give our advancement report. All right, thank you, Rick. Um, again, I'm Kristen and uh, I'm gonna be sharing a little bit about community engagement, um, a few words about our legacy circle and um, talking about a couple of projects in progress. Um, so first of all, um, we continue to um, develop and expand our offerings for hikes and community events. So you can see some statistics here. Um, community engagement really um, is critical to helping us reach new people, um, spark and deepen interest in the natural world and really just build a movement of people who care. Um, simply put, we don't tend to care about things that we don't understand. Um, and so spending time in natural landscapes, um, not only scientifically provides us with uh, health benefits, but uh, don't you just feel better when you have a chance to be outside for a day? Um, so the growth of a community, people who understand and value our natural resources um, is a win for both the people and the land. Um, events this past year have included topics ranging from winter tree and shrub identification, prairies, birding, um, and rare plants, to name a few. 
Um, if you've joined us, then you have probably met Sarah Norman, our community engagement manager extraordinaire, um, or Charlie Kearns, our Northern Conservation Specialist. Um, activities um, they have helped to coordinate and lead um, ranged from paddling the North, the Lake Superior shoreline to snowshoeing with um, UW South students and faculty along the Red Cedar River, um, and of course, plenty of hiking. Uh, we've expanded our community work days um, to a total of 20 across five properties. Um, and um, this not only extends our staff capacity, um, but really helps to build volunteer knowledge, skills, and uh, care for the land as well. Um, key places that have reaped the benefits of these work days include Maiden Rock State Natural Area, where we've focused on Bluff Prairie and Oak Savannah restoration. Um, Tyler Forks Community Forest, where we've completed steps down to the Tyler Forks River, um, a connector trail with the Copper Falls State Park, and more. Um, we're exploring new ways to make conservation education more accessible in the coming year, and we look forward to continuing to broaden our base with new participants. So stay tuned and please join us when you are able. Up next, I'm going to say a few words about something that's very exciting to our future. Um, as we all know, forever is a really long time. Um, and so when we commit to protecting land forever, uh, we promise to uphold the conservation values of this land through, um, as Rick explained, continued relationship with multiple generations of landowners, um, as well as annual monitoring. Um, and to do this with integrity, we need to have sufficient investments in place that help ensure our funding year after year. Um, an important way we're able to follow through on stewardship and land management requirements um, is through legacy giving. Um, a gift given through a person's will or trust is oftentimes the most impactful gift they're able to give. Um, and it's one that continues to make an impact beyond the giver's lifetime. To reiterate the theme we shared at the beginning of our meeting, um, our legacy donors are important change makers that have really been pivotal to helping chart our course as an organization. Earlier this year, we announced a legacy challenge uh, whereby we receive $1,000 in general operating support um, that in a match to the first uh, 50 new bequest commitments. Um, I'm excited to share that we're off and running with 12 new members already, and we're excited to continue growing this important group. Please reach out if you have questions about uh, plan giving or the legacy challenge, um, and certainly consult a trusted financial advisor uh, regarding what may be best for your particular situation. Um, finally, I have two uh, projects that are near and dear to the hearts of many of you. Um, and one of them being the Brownstone Trail. Um, as you may know, we've been working on a multi-year approach to long-term restoration of the Brownstone Trail. Um, so I'm gonna speak about this for a few minutes and then we'll move along also to talk about the Pine Coulee in Prescott, which um, you may or may not have heard of yet, um, uh, which is our newest undertaking. So uh, first of all, the Brownstone Trail um, is located in Bayfield County. Um, in Bayfield along the Lake, Sh Lake Superior shoreline. Um, and historically, um, some folks began using the former railroad grade as a trail um, as early as the 1970s when the trains ceased operating. Um, the trail was officially established in 1996 um, as the first official project of one of our predecessor organizations, Bayfield Regional Conservancy. Um, so the trail is comprised of a number of trail easements that cross private property um, and recent erosion um, has caused a section of trail to be closed and uh, rerouted. Um, back in 2019, um, the board voted to accept donation of a slumped parcel. Um, and then in, in the following year, we completed a coastal engineering study to establish um, different options moving forward. Um, and the, the most um, viable um, and cost-effective long-term solution uh, was determined to be purchasing the upslope adjacent 
commercial property, um, which we were able to fundraise um, and purchase at the end of last year. Um, so I want to recognize um, a couple of key people. Uh, first of all, um, Kim and Kito Reimer for their tremendous support um, in the form of a $500,000 matching fund. Um, and Erica Lang, who's pictured here, um, our conservation manager in our Bayfield office uh, for her continuous role as both, uh, as both a catalyst and a change major maker, not only for this project, but a variety of other land protection initiatives, um, particularly in the North. Um, there are two options for access around the closed section at this time. Uh, last November, we were able to create a new walking route that avoids the highway, but does include stairs. Um, and these um, routes, um, both the walking and the uh, bike and stroller access routes uh, will be in place for the next several years as we continue to fundraise and begin to restore the slope um, and reroute the trail um, in that section long-term. Um, there are um, a variety of steps to the restoration. Um, and so I've kind of mapped that out for you here. Um, first and foremost, we will be stabilizing the shoreline with large rock. Uh, we'll need to remove fill to reduce the steepness of the slope um, and then create a new section of trail with minimum elevation change, 8% um, max in that section and no stairs. Um, and finally, we will, um, we will be doing plantings and some habitat restoration in this area. So in all, this is a two-year restoration project, um, and there is a fair chance we'll be able to start next summer, but uh, breaking ground really hinges upon our successful fundraising. Um, currently, we're fundraising, uh, we're focused on grants um, primarily this fall, um, and we're um, certainly welcoming gifts from individuals as well. Um, we have a goal overall of 2.5 million for this phase, and we're hoping um, that about 20% or about 500,000 of that will come from the community and the balance will come from um, a variety of grant sources. Um, so next year we anticipate fund uh, finalizing the restoration design, uh, selecting contractors, um, and then a couple seasons of restoration work, um, finally uh, capping things off with the creation of a community park that will be uh, managed um, and owned long-term by Bayfield County. Uh, Landmark Conservancy will um, continue to lead um, restoration fundraising and uh, the overall um, execution of the restoration. Um, I think that's all I've got to say about, uh, let me just go back a second here. Um, that's all I've got to say about the Brownstone Trail, um, but just a quick um, thank you um, to our partner um, in Bayfield Area Trails, um, who is um, exceptional in helping us to um, do the day-to-day -day stewardship. Um, we have a lot of great local volunteers on the ground um, in Bayfield and uh, that support is really essential to uh, keeping the trail groomed and uh, um, safe and uh, um, in good condition for use. So thank you to um, all of those volunteers. Um, next up, the Pine Coulee, uh, which Rick mentioned earlier. Um, and this project has been developing over the past three years. Uh, with the partners named here. Uh, Freedom Park specifically came to us about three years ago um, during our COVID kind of lockdown when uh, everyone was kind of holed up in their offices and homes. And uh, we, we heard from their executive director at the time with uh, interest in, in bringing us on for this acquisition um, in Prescott. And uh, over time, we had conversations with uh, staff and board and community members, um, including the Cooley River Trails organization, uh, which is a community-led um, organization that operates with uh, a fiscal agent agreement with Freedom Park. And so um, these two entities have been fantastic partners in helping to get this off the ground. 
Uh, Freedom Park, you can see on the map, is in kind of the orange color. Um, and then they're um, getting some great uh, traction on their work at McGee Park, uh, where they're building um, a section of trail as well as a mountain biking skills course. Um, and Cooley River Trails, um, with, um, with support from Freedom Park, has developed an overall citywide uh, trail network um, that has been accepted by the city of Prescott. And so um, while the Pine Cooley Nature Preserve uh, once uh, purchased will be um, an exceptional um, asset in its own right, it will also intersect uh, with a broader citywide trails network. So it's all really exciting and we're grateful to be um, a lead partner in this initiative. Um, a little bit about the Pine Coulee. Um, as Rick said, it's 76 acres of a uh, variety of types of, of land. Um, there's a rocky gorge um, that feeds into the, uh, the Coulee drains into the river, the Mississippi River there. Um, and there is both native prairie and oak savanna remnant. Um, and um, the property overall shows high climate resilience and um, an ability to host a great amount of biodiversity, um, as well as um, providing important bird habitat uh, for migrating birds. Um, most um, exceptionally, however, the one of the greatest assets of this property is its proximity to the city of Prescott and its um, ability to provide um, a, um, outdoor recreation and um, education um, for the community and uh, hopefully to spark a love of nature and uh, a learning opportunity as well. Um, so we're about halfway, um, largely due to support of the um, DNR um, and we're just uh, beginning to involve um, individuals. And so, uh, if this sparks your interest, if, if you'd like to consider making a gift, um, please uh, visit our website. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, with questions and uh, we look forward to keeping you up to date. Um, finally, I'm uh, we're nearly to the end here and we'll close with some questions, um, but I want to just offer a couple of invitations um, to you um, to become and, and remain involved. Um, like we said earlier, we have a presentation coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, Craig Thompson uh, will be uh, with us again virtually on Wednesday, October 4th, um, talking about the power of birds. Um, and I'm going to read a little bit of his, his event description because I thought it was really inspiring. Um, he talks, he'll talk about how um, climate change and the extinction crisis are the greatest challenges of our time, both phenomena pose existential threats to the future of life. Um, and the decline of birds is a manifestation of the extinction crisis and serves as a clarion call to action. Uh, but in his presentation, he's gonna talk about how birds offer the promise of hope um, and uh, provide examples of birds as a power, uh, powerful conservation catalyst, including uh, strategies for engagement. So please consider joining us uh, for that. Um, we also have some upcoming work days um, and uh, encourage you to get outside and enjoy protected properties um, and marvel at the beauty of the changing leaves and the changing season, um, possibly through a hike on protected land. Um, finally, um, just a reminder that our work is only possible with your support. Um, so please um, continue to Stay involved um, and thank you for all the ways um, that you help further our mission of land protection. With that, uh, we'll close for the evening and I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to catch up with us, um, learn about completed work and uh, what is coming down the pipe. Look forward to hopefully seeing you all again soon. Um, thanks again, have a great night.